We're in for a fun time. I, said, I see Robert over here, but I hear Robert over there, and it's very confusing. Yeah, Robert, um, you know, you're supposed to wear masks for these, these meetings, please. I got, I've got one big one. It's between me and all the other participants. It's called Texas. And actually, it's time to start. Okay, so we've got, uh, looks like we have our authors. We've got who we've got, so uh, I guess we should get going. You, you want to, you want to MC? I'll drive, because I get the whole machine that works. Okay, welcome to STIR at IETF 114. Next slide, please. This is the note well. By uh, this point, you probably have already read it, but uh, please make sure you follow it uh, if you're going to contribute. Next slide. Just remind everybody that about uh, respectful engagement here. Please make sure you follow the IETF code of conduct. Next slide. Um, before I go through this, just to remind everybody, keep your masks on in, in the meeting, um, and only the person presenting on the uh, pink square should be maskless. Uh, thank you. Next slide. Um, this is the agenda that we posted. Um, several. Uh, well, I don't believe this is the agenda. Is it a missing it? item? Is it, or is that another page? I think that we're missing. Yes, that looks more like the agenda that we posted. Yeah. Did we include a second slide? Yeah, I think oh. We have <laughs> oh, that's a status slide. Status slide. Yes, right. Okay. right. Sorry. Uh, this is the, just to say uh, the documents that had reached some uh, milestone and remind people that uh, error handling closes today in terms of its last call. I had not seen any comments on the list this week. Um, but we were hoping to uh, uh, deal with any uh, comments that came out during the, call, the session today that there were. And uh, on the last one, the, the OOB document, we had said that when the next one's updated, we will start uh, working group last call. We're still waiting to see that document. So that's nudge. <laughs> next. I'll let the notes say that uh, John raised the thumb. <laughs> yeah, this is Chris. Um, there was some comments from Paul that I think I, I included that in my slides to talk about. Okay, our, awesome. our handling, so. Okay, thank you. Been a little uh, oh. distracted from my email this uh, with and the then going. One comment here. I think the uh, version numbers have all updated since we made this slide, at least the first two. No, the first two have. So that's correct. <laughs> uh, next. And this is the agenda, the one that was posted um, a couple weeks ago. Any agenda bashing? And then let's proceed with this. With RCD. RCD. This. Okay. Now I got to remember how to change. Yeah, you close it, open close it, it, and open yeah. the next one. Okay. And this is RCD. Yay. Okay, so um, as noted, uh, there's 19, which was recently released. Um, I believe mostly editorial, but why don't you go to the next slide? Um, as I just said, uh, most of the changes between 17 and 19 uh, have been mostly editorial and discussed on the list um, between meetings. Uh, do appreciate all the editorial cleanup that happened, especially in the abstract and intro. There's, it's been, the document's been obviously changing uh, for a while now, and um, mostly there were changes to bring things up to date with some of the changes. Um, and I added some examples and some other things like that. There was one normative language change uh, that was actually, I think, 
uh, Ben's comment, uh, I changed a must to a should in the security considerations section. Uh, and I have the exact quote down there. Um, ben, you have a comment? I was just going to say, I think my comment was about the normativity, not necessarily the must versus being must versus being should. It was along the lines of trying to make normative requirements on the ecosystem. Um, seemed kind of dodgy to me, but I don't have a strong feeling there one way or the other. So I don't know if it's well, that are you saying that even with should as being a normative thing or, you know, I, I guess I'm okay with should it's still normative, but, uh, I guess I, 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 I guess my I intent it was it. to make it. I don't hate it enough to push another revision unless there's other reason to. <laughs> Any uh, comments about that? I mean, I guess I think the statement we want to make sure people are thinking about appropriate policies uh, along with this, but um, and I think that was sort of the spirit that those normative comments were implied. But um, I'm okay either way. I don't see anybody objecting, so. John Peterson. So, I mean, look, the part of it is that we're not going to bless any such entity, right, or a set of policies here in the ITF, yeah. right? I mean, I can imagine use cases for an RCD passport that you know are much more informal outside of shaken like contexts. And so I don't think an ITF specification should, you know, stipulate anything too strongly there. And I agree that the wording here is kind of tortuous, right? It's got the Marcy D passport lowercase must follow some form of vetting in which <laughs> and then should follow an applicable policy of an ecosystem. Um, I just I don't think we want to require that an ecosystem have such an applicable policy. That's really what it comes down to. We have remote. We have remote people. Yeah. Please. Not Mr. Lennox. Scott Lennox. I mean, I guess. And, and you know, technically, you can... we should be using the cube. But yeah, sorry. Go ahead. I guess everything follows, you know, follows the null policies trivially. But I guess maybe that's, you know, not interesting to say. Also, there's something wrong grammatically with that sentence. Yeah, I'll admit I missed the first must. <laughs> no, no, it's more whether it's identical. What, what are, what is the is. Is that meant to be an IT apostrophe S, yes, or there's also a, a list with no and? I'm confused by the grammar of that sentence, but anyway. Okay. There, there will be, uh, hopefully, before even the RC editor is left with the daunting task of like turning this into English, we probably should do like an Englishing pass at some point. Yeah. Do we see 20? <laughs> <laughs> Well, there will be a 20 no matter what, but I, I guess the question is, does that happen before Working Group's last call or not? We're in Working Group's last call. Or getting out of Working Group's last call. Sorry, I apologize. So the question to me is whether you want a 20 that gets sent to the area director or you want to send 19 to the area director. I mean, I, I would be okay sending 19 to an area director, making it their problem. I'm sure there will be some editorial feedback that will come back in addition to everything else. This is Rich Shockey. I agree with Jonathan, with Mr. Peterson. <laughs> 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 I would certainly support sending 19 forward as soon as practically possible. There is a <laughs> queue of implementers ready to use this uh, sooner rather than later. Fully agree with that. So what I uh, heard is we're going to leave this grammatical error in there to see if the AD notices. OK. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will comment, Ben, again. Uh, the clearer it is, the quicker it will get through the initial AD review. Um, I don't think this is necessarily a clarity problem, but just something to keep in mind. 
or all yeah. right we're going to send it today <laughs> you already have the, the I, I'll work on that. <laughs> all right i think the next Oops. page is did that jump too far no we're good Okay. So can the authors please send me a statement about the IPR so that I'm not waiting on that when I do the write-up? Yes. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Close that. I think I do have it already started. Next is... Uh, what's next to the agenda? I don't have the agenda. Okay. Wow. Next is messaging. Okay. Welcome to reality. This is Philly in reality. It's not just online. Um, although many are on. Next slide, please. We're about to talk about messaging. And I'm going to try to talk through a mask because I think it's the first time I've ever given a talk through a mask. We'll see how it goes. Um, so as you can see at the top of the slide, there was a draft ITF STIR messaging 03. And I immediately replaced it with a 04, uh, like yesterday, which I'm sure no one in here has read. But for those that have not been following this work, just you know, like a page turner novel, um, what this draft basically is suggesting is that the systems we built for STIR, especially the certification systems that are now widely deployed and are being more widely, widely deployed uh, worldwide, you know, probably could be repurposed to handle text and multimedia messaging instead of just setting up telephone calls. And of course, the systems we have set up for this in certification are limited to telephone numbers. So we're not talking about, you know, messaging that has nothing to do with telephone numbers. And there's a ton of that, and it's super interesting messaging. But for the moment, the restriction of the scope of this draft is to that. I will remind people, however, that is not a restriction inherent to passports or to their transmission in STIR, just to the um, certification systems we have specified here in the ITF so far. Why are we doing this? Well, you know, robocalling is like super annoying, but message spam is becoming uh, a problem that's equally annoying in a lot of places. And so, you know, you can kind of, you have some different tools you can bring to bear on trying to prevent spam and messaging, but especially as encrypted messaging rises, these kind of Bayesian tools we use for email analysis to figure out, is this about some sort of pharmaceutical that perhaps is being widely advertised or something like that? Can't really do that for encrypted messaging. So uh, we think this could help. Next slide. We had a working group last call, much like with RCD, a shorter one. Um, we did get in a bunch of comments, some of which I addressed in 03, but a lot of which I did not address in 03. And so we are trying to clean all that up. Thank you to Krister, Russ, Ben, Brian Rosen, Jack Rickard for reviewing that. Next slide. I don't think there's like a ton more to talk about about this. Um, you know, there's a couple of topics that I think we can go through that maybe are still open issues. We were just talking about on the list. One, for example, would be allowing the message I parameter in other passport types than the message passport type. What is message I? This is basically like a hash that's over the content of the message, in particular the mime body. So whether that is, you know, multimedia, it could be multi-part, it could have text and all this other stuff, but just take the entire mind scope, put a hash over it, that's what gets embedded into the passport itself. The question naturally arose. Could there be other passports than message in which we'd want to include message I? Following the great tradition where, for example, we allow um, RCD, which is just an element that appears in the passport, to also appear like in a shake it passport if people want to do that. Are there similar cases or it might make sense to have this like message integrity parameter in some other passport type? My argument is I don't think so. And like I think the opportunity for confusion around this is too great. And that moreover, um, getting into this polymorphism, as we discussed on the list, where how do you mix and match between these different passport types? This is like all this aggravation and complexity and hassle I see there. So I'm not super psyched about that, but I thought we'd give an opportunity. If anybody here would like to talk about, go to bat for the notion there could be other passport types where a message I could appear. Anybody care? So I'm in the queue, and I'll say first, for the record, I did not propose polymorphism. Yes. 
I just kind of wish sometimes that we had it, but I'm glad we don't. Um, my main thoughts here was not to make it hard for someone else in the future who wants to specify another use for this. And, you know, if we say must not, then any, if, if we come up with another kind of message passport in the future, this is where the polymorphic suit came in, maybe some kind of combination of RCD with message I, or, you know, just throwing something off, we have to come back and update this draft to allow something else to do it. A cost uh, but that's, that's I'm not, willing to pay personally. Okay. And that's, <laughs> and, you know, if, if everyone else is okay with that, I'm okay with that too. It's a low cost, it's a low bar. You need to have a spec anyway, and you're just adding like updates, RFC this, to whatever that spec is, right? Low cost. And it looks like we've got Robert with you. Mr. Spock, what's up, man? I'm gonna try not to waste too much time on this, but. You're really you're, quiet. You're honestly. really quiet. How about now? A little better. So, Part of the reticence, I think, to just letting other passport types pick this up is based on confusion. And I think that we should spend just a few seconds wondering if our nice little short name, um, MSGI, the MSG part in particular, is really going to be future proof enough for us given how generic a name it is and how easy it is to confuse what you might mean by message if the context isn't just dead freaking obvious that you're talking about an instant message kind of thing i am willing to i'm willing to entertain and contemplate that for a moment um when we call the draft stir for messaging, we're using message pretty generically. We have a pretty generic definition of message in the sense it's not limited merely to textual messages, but also incorporates multimedia messaging. I mean, I guess I look at it like, you know, we define two streams for these things that could effectively appear in the message, I should say three, things that could appear in the message method, things that could be negotiated as part of a session by SIP like MSRP or whatever. And then finally, out of band applications. I agree on out of band message can be taken pretty broadly when you're no longer talking about like SIP is a transport. So, um, I don't know. I think message has enough of a kind of stable understanding. I think people understand that a message isn't an email, right? Um, Call it email message. You can say email message, it's true. Um, and then again, I mean, frankly, a lot of like SMPP and protocols that are used to transport these things like are often SMTP adjacent and MMS as well. Um, I don't know. I think it's okay. I mean, we could call it like a mime thing, like, but then you lose the session part. It's like, what else do you call it? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know a better one. Naming is one of the three hard computer science problems. And I'm willing to leave it alone. I just wanted to kick it around for a minute. So, you know, the, the kind of potential confusion I can see at an implementer's layer, um, especially if your implementers aren't um, native English speakers, is, is this thing some sort of, you know, integrity check over the datagram that the passport appears in kind of thing. Right. So, you know, um, but I'm, I'm perfectly willing to leave it alone. I mean, I don't think it's any worse than RCD and RCDI. Like, what is RCD, <laughs> right? And like, that's also pretty open-ended and pretty pretty gnarly, really. Jack, what do you think, man? I'm, I kind of don't care from a message point of view, but the, I'm, I'm slightly more worried about the fact that it's not, like, this could end up with some slightly odd side effects, like verifiers that understand this message spec will mark these as invalid, but those that don't will treat it as valid because they'll just ignore the message I, and assuming it's not like a PPT, like, sorry, if there's a passport that's not a message passport with a message I on it. So it could just have slightly weird side effects that I'm kind of slightly nervous about. 
yeah, I mean, that's that's why I don't want to allow it, right? I said this on the list. <laughs> like, I'm totally worried about those side effects. I, I want this to be scoped to message passports for that reason. But I think Robert was like poking at something else, like is, is message really the best description for this? Or is there a CRISPR thing that is closer to capturing like what we need? Uh, yeah. Other thoughts? Chairs can run the queue. I can barely see the queue over there. Uh, Jack, what's a uh, beer? I was just going to say, I feel like you kind of missed the point of what I was trying to say, which was okay. that, like, you can't, if you, like, there's a question of enforcement on the verifier side. Like, a verifier that enforces this will look very different to one that doesn't. And that might cause problems. Like, admittedly, like, the signer should have never done this in the first place. The AS should have never done this. But like from a VS that's just accepting random things from the internet, like you kind of have to worry about that. I am not following you. It's true. Who does what? Be more, be, be, elaborate a little bit because I'm not getting you. Um, if a future or weird uh, AS creates yeah. a passport with a message eye on it that's not a not that that's not a that's like ppt shaken or rcd or whatever a verifier that does not implement this spec will carry on just fine we'll go yeah everything's fine there's this there's this weird message eye but i don't understand it so i'm going to ignore it and ppt rcd lets me do that right but a verifier that does understand this will go Ha, huh, that's message I that's not want, meant to appear on RCDs and then drop it. Yeah. And the that, that feels like odd behavior where someone who doesn't understand this will verify a call, like will just mark this figure as verified, but one that doesn't won't. But what is it going to do with an RCD passport that has a message I in it? What's the message? Well, that doesn't matter. Like, oh, I think it does. I think it's very similar the, to the question. Like, What's it, the it, AS? Does, it, oh, yeah, the AS has done something really funky here. But like, from the VS's which point not, of view, like... It, which it's disallowed from doing if it's compliant with the specification. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. But like, yeah. this is the internet we're talking about. Yeah. The, so like, yeah, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not convinced this is definitely a problem, but it just seems very strange to me that verifiers will verify these passports correctly or incorrectly depending on whether or not they implement this spec so i'd be willing to trade the language for as may not include in pbts that are non-message and vs's must ignore if in pbts that are non-message that help that would make me much more comfortable okay i can do that wait what's that last part so it was ASs are disallowed from including message I in non-message passports, and VSs that receive message I in non-message passports should must ignore. It just, it, it, I mean, it, it, it's kind of what's implied, but it's not stipulated directly by the text that's there now. I can do that. Severe. Severe. Okay, thanks. Uh... So John, I think that first uh, bullet point, um, sorry, I, I need to review the document. I, I must confess that. But when you mentioned that in other PPTs, right? Uh, for example, we define other PPTs, for example, RPH, right? Yeah. Uh, we defined, right? So do we need to do anything for those PPTs or no, no. are you suggesting that? Because uh, none of those PPTs stipulate using message I at this point, right? Correct. Like RPH, RPH is already in RFC. It doesn't right. say anything about using message I. Correct. Right. So we don't need to, this is this is basically again, it's a way to prevent. There's a particular confusion that is like the inverse of what Jack was just discussing that I'm worried about. Okay. Which is a case where somebody intends to be saying there's a message I want integrity over. They send it in a non-message passport type, oh, and right. the semantics of the fact that supposed to be out of message are lost if the verification service doesn't recognize message I at all. And so a passport that was intended to be securing a message could be viewed as being valid for like a telephone call, right? And I'm concerned that there's like a little bit of security weakness in that if we don't clamp this down. 
And the language I was discussing with Jack, I mean, it, it's a, you know, it's a much crisper and, you know, more specific version of the language that's in the draft today. I think that gets at what I'm trying to prevent. Okay. So I think key is the non-passport types, right? That's non-message non passport, passport Yes. Okay. Okay. I just don't want, again, it's going to be really wonky okay. and, and polymorphic in okay. ways I don't want. <laughs> okay. Thanks, I got Chris? Yeah, I, I, um, for me, I, I wasn't sure where we were going, but where we landed, I, I like, so thumbs up. Okay. The other thing that really came up, if, if there's nothing more on this, is anybody else in queue on this? No? Okay. The only other thing that came up that I thought was like worth mentioning from last call is really what we're opening the door to with out of band for this. And it's to make sure, you know, we all here understand and are comfortable with the notion that much like with stir out of band, you know, what we mean by out of band is non SIP. We mean that, you know, there's something like an HTTP service that like is carrying these passports and it's adjacent to the telephone call in some fashion, the way it's stipulated in 8816. There's a, call placement service. This is a web service to, to upload passports in which they can be accessed by verification services. Like, you know, this could apply to basically any kind of messaging, right? Um, that you could build a web service to be adjacent to from vanilla SMS to very complex. You could do this for like Facebook messages, right? There, I mean, it, that would be in scope of this. Um, I guess they don't use telephone numbers. So probably not. We use it for WhatsApp. We'll say WhatsApp. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so like, I, I just want to make sure people get it, that there's nobody who's present at this meeting that really feels like this is too broad a scope to allow with that will be for doing message. I think it's fine. I think it's potentially useful. I think we get some actual like leverage out of it. Ben, thoughts? Um, I, I would like to keep it. Um, one thing, one thought I do have, and now I'm trying to remember what the text actually says is that we the draft contemplates that other messaging types might use OOB, but it doesn't specify you know, a particular binding to any particular kind of messaging. I mean, it, it alludes to like SMTP. Right, so it might be worth having some disclaimer language saying, but someone else has to go specify how to do that. You know, this, th that problem is not solved by this draft. It's merely hinting at a, uh, at a uh, solution direction that someone might take. But in general, the idea that uh, we could con conceivably use this for messaging types that do not have some way to carry a passport in band, I think is a, is a road that we should not close yet. Yeah, I mean, again, pointing to 8816, it's not like out of band says, you know, it, it, it puts any stipulations like that, right? I mean, it's very much as like, hey, whatever communication system is you're using, it doesn't happen to be set. Like, you know, CPS can help you out with that. And I think we're saying the same thing here. And I, I don't really know that we need uh, any additional kind of hazard tape around that to get that across. Uh, John Banks, I mean, the one concern I'd raise is that once, you know, since, since you're doing a cryptographic hash over the message, you better make sure that whatever you're doing is an 100% unambiguous way of encoding itself as a mime body and not, you know, Anything like, you know, oh, hey, we did Unicode normalization or something weird like that, so. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a requirement in the draft now that, you know, whatever it is, turn this into MIME, and like that MIME is what we're signing over and has to be unambiguous, but like. Yeah, I mean, it just, it seems to be harder for OOB when it's not, when you, know, you have to translate it out of MIME and then back in, so, but that's not your problem here, I guess. I hope it's not. <laughs> All right, I just want to make sure we aired those two issues. Other than that, I don't think there's much by way of open issues remaining here. I think we got it, and I think we should uh, declare working last call has occurred and that we did this, and we should ship it. Unless, does anybody here think this requires more before we ship it? Hearing no such sentiments, I will leave that matter to the chair's result. And no, did anyone put anything in chat? No, not, not a few seconds. Okay, just making sure. So, John, just one question. This version is the one you think is ready to go? The uh, zero four. Yes. Right. So, uh, it's just a matter of, I'll be the shepherd on this one. So, it's a matter of me getting the proto write up done and then we'll ship it. I heard 
I heard an agreement to add a little bit of text that you probably don't yeah. want to add. Uh -oh. I did just agree to that, and I'm totally going back on it. Well, like, so, Jack, would you be cool if we did that insertion after ITF last call? That would be a typical way to resolve this. We just make sure we won't lose it. It's what, a 10 minute cycle to add that and, and push another revision? Fine, I'll do it. Just as long as it's close to the top of your new stuff queue. And next is error handling. Oh, we're not done. No, he said that comments came in. <laughs> yes, which I included. So next slide. Uh, just to go over the changes from the last version, um, I did change PPT to PPI, um, which maybe is better, like passport identifier. Um, and I did miss uh, adding a request for that um, parameter name, so I added that as well. And then probably the most substantive thing that I have here is that I made the compact form the recommended form. Uh, given the security issues that have all been brought up. And I think we sort of discussed that at the last meeting and I think had tentative agreement on that. Um, I have not removed support for full form, um, but, you know, have all the caveats in the document for potential, uh, you know, giving up of information if it goes past the, you know, for diversion uh, use cases where the full passport could go upstream from the authentication service that uh, created that passport. Uh, next slide. So um, there, there have been some um, list discussions that I wanted to highlight. Uh, Paul's came in um, very recently, um, but I think are relevant to talk about. Um, Krister did have a comment um, from a little while ago um, that I was trying to figure out that he asked about announcing support for the reason header specific to the specification or the stir protocol. Um, I'm not really aware of a precedent for doing that. Um, so I was hesitant to include that, but certainly up for discussion whether and if there's any thoughts that this might be a good idea. I see Robert's in queue. Robert? I'm sorry, I put myself in queue anticipating moving on to the next point. So I'll remove myself and head myself again in a moment. Okay. Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, there, in, correct me, this is a good Robert question and Ben question and other SIP Mafia people here. There's no like uh, supported, required, or whatever, for a reason, is there? In any, I, I went and glanced back at whatever that is, 30. 328 or wherever we specified reason. I didn't see anything like that. So. So this is Robert. The. You're no, very quiet I'm, again, Robert. It's, um, it's it's been a constant churn, though, um, of a mess of having this implied support signaling thing, and it it did come up the last time we were seriously punching through reason um and kind of remembering it coming in through history info and every time we've driven our way through the conversation in the past we've ended up on that that kind of implicit signaling is not helpful and that we wouldn't do it okay i mean we do a lot of the purpose of this draft was to align some of the things we did in 10,074, um, we, we did not put that in there. That's not necessarily a good or bad reason to, to not do it, but I'd certainly prefer um, the path forward to not have to define that. Jonathan, the next, does anything go wrong if you just blindly insert it? I mean, if somebody ignores it, okay, they don't know why, you know, they don't know what went wrong, but they wouldn't have known what went wrong, what went wrong if you didn't insert it in the first place, so. I, I, yeah, I agree. 
Yeah. Uh, like if you don't understand stir um, reason headers, then stir protocol reason headers, then you just ignore them. Well, this is a red shocking, and there are obviously precedents here, which is 608, you know, 608 reason codes, 607, and the soon to be finalized 603 reason code for uh, blocking of, uh, you know, blocking of calls in the network, which has, shall we say, uh, aggravated certain elements of industry. Yeah. So, I mean, there is ample precedent for reasons, reason codes. Yeah, reason headers in general, it's just announcing specifically when, when you send the invite that um, you're, you're, you support that and whether or not the far side should put in a reason setter. So I think it's a slightly different topic, but. Um, so technical apology here, I've just lost a network connection and I'm the one who's running the slides. So, oh, it's coming back. Let's see if I can get it back. Nope. Okay, here we go. Uh, is that where we were? Good. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Um, okay, next comment. Uh, this is from Paul. Um, and I guess Robert's probably the most relevant person to talk about this, whether or not we should uh, finish uh, multiple reasons, or I think Paul specifically was saying, have it at least get to working group last call before we move on with this uh, going to working group last call. Yeah, this is Robert. I think that's silly. Um, I, I wish Paul were here. Um, we've already got mechanisms for normative dependencies, um, making the right thing happen before things move to RFC, and I don't think this is going to be a high controversy thing that would cause this particular draft to have to change um, as that one is is moving through. If that turns out to not be true, you know, things going to be parked waiting for it anyhow. So, you know, it can always be a yank. So I think we should just go ahead and let the um, um, process move forward for this draft while the, the other one proceeds. Now, I'm going to apologize on multiple reasons. I missed Brian's call for the SIPCOR working group 00 at the beginning of June. I didn't see it until I was preparing for this minute. Um, that's in now. I'll have a 01 in shortly that actually addresses all the feedback so far. And I fully expect that we'll, um, I'll be pushing SIPCOR to working group last call multiple, multiple reasons um, before August is over. So this, it's not like this is going to be a big blocking thing that we have to wait for a long time on. Okay. Yeah, this is Rich Hockey. I just want to add, and Chris, I don't know <clears throat> whether you want to incorporate it or not, but remember, reason codes may or may not have privacy implications. And I've already seen this in 607, 608, and 603. It's whether or not you want to add, there may well be some considerations here or just skip it, but these, do, these kinds of issues do come up with uh, verbose explanations of why you're doing a particular activity. Yeah, I think the identified privacy issue was that we included the full passport that had, you know, uh, you know, the call, the originating number and destination number. Um, we've addressed that by recommending compact form. So I think that's the only thing that could potentially be an issue there, um, or at least that's come up as an issue. So I think we're okay with that one. Uh, next one is um, being more explicit about the use case for multiple errors, or maybe even having an explicit constraint on only having a single cause code for each PPI. Um, I think the rules for that and the guidance in 8224 is to only really there can only be one cause code for an error 
from an identity header. So I guess the question is, would there ever be a case that there is multiple cause codes? Um, or, or if there is, do we want to restrict that in the future? Yeah, I mean, this is John Peterson, sorry. And I'm not using the Q thing at all. I should, I should be better. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the constraint that's in RFC 224, really, we intended that cause codes, SIP cause codes set in the backwards direction, hopefully indicate repairable conditions, right? It's giving you information you could use to re-originate this request and this time use a trust anchor that's supported by the other side or, you know, fix whatever your syntactical problem is or something like that. Um, I mean, prima facie, I mean, there could be a ton of things that are wrong <laughs> with any given like, you know, passport and invite that you get that would, you know, potentially necessitate multiple such uh, cause codes being applicable. I, I guess I viewed it like you would do it onesie twosie, but, you know. So, I mean, I mean, I would be fine because this is a decision we made in 224 was effectively, you know, mm -hmm. you're going to have a single um, expression of something that's wrong that needs to be fixed that you're sending back. That's a reason for rejecting it. I mean, it's also important to note there can be like cascading conditions like, okay, this is what I thought was wrong. And so I rejected it at this VS for this reason. And then you send it through and it's going to go to some further element that will have some different problem with it that will result in a different cause code being sent. So I'm not even sure that it's possible to try to consolidate what all the multiple mm -hmm. potential errors are associated with these things simply because it's an orchestrated service, right? Yep. Um, so I'd be fine with, with having that constraint, but I also think it would it would probably be okay if you wanted to have multiple ones. If you are aware of multiple ones, there's no, you know, there's no no particular reason not to communicate all of them. So like Yeah, I, I was sort of taking the tact of like it's sort of already constrained based on the cause codes that I already defined, but um so no change is necessary and we don't know what's gonna happen in the future to your point of cascading things yeah. or other things like that. Orchestrated services act. So I, I, I mean, I guess for the sake of simplicity, which is usually the right decision to make, I would do single. So make that change is what you're suggesting. Okay. I mean, like I said, it, this is one gig go either way. If you'd rather not change it, I'm, I'm just saying like, that's the decision we made in 2024. Okay. I, 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 yeah, I can make that change. Um, next one, should we not remove the reason header, but only remove PPI? Um, and this is only for the case of full form. Um, so I, that, um, I understand the request. Um, it allows for full form. I guess maybe that gets back to the question of whether and not we think full form will or should be used. I guess I'm curious about precedent for this one as well. Removing a parameter versus a header. And this is this is on the backwards direction from the AIS, so just to be clear. I mean, it, again, it, it makes sense to remove it for uh, but only remove PPI and only for full form, not for compact form. I mean, so, for compact so form. PP, PPI is the parameter that holds the, yeah. the passport. So in, I think what Paul is saying is instead of removing the entire reason header, let the reason header with the cause code go or remove the identifying information if it's full form. Only if it's full form, yeah. yeah. That makes sense. I don't mind putting that guidance in, especially if I'm making changes. Uh, Jack? Um, I guess my question is why? What's the benefit of only removing PPI and only for full form? Is there any harm in just removing the whole thing all the time? I mean, the, the, the point is just you can get away with it for compact form because you're not leaking the information, but you are leaking it in full form. I, 
I, I would have the same question, you know, is it useful information for upstream from the AS that signed it to know that there was an error that happened, you know, without yeah. the identifying information? What, like, I guess that could be, if, if you, if we want to flush out the logic of that, you know, do we need to describe why that happened and, and all that good stuff, so. Yeah. There are other dialog matching indicators and the SIP transactions and you know, presence of the passport. So, yeah. Now, Roman seems to be in queue. What's up, Roman? I'm just thinking probably better to remove it because uh, that way, if you have a feature implemented somewhere down the line from uh, like some device, like there is a uh, there is something which is signing. And then it's getting back to reason, removes the reason, passes this thing through, and essentially whatever is the device upstream is not going to see any of the store reasons or any of the new features. So it's kind of like makes it nice and contained to, uh, to the device which actually is implementing store versus we're just passing some reasons with the new uh, reason pro uh, with a new reason protocol somewhere upstream to a device which. Otherwise, had, uh, doesn't know or need care about any of that. So that's yeah. why, what my reason for removing it completely versus just removing the PPI. Yeah, yeah, I think that's actually a really good point. Like, you know, if you get the reason header with stir and you don't have a PPI, you don't know what to do. So I guess back to my comment of like, um, do we do we is that even a use case that we care about and want to give the details of? Um, I, I sort of am yeah. maybe might have a stronger opinion about just removing the reason header. I mean, but the whole point of compact form is you can always match that against the original passport you generated, right? Like, and so that's always. But theoretically, the you know, if you remove it at the AS that generated the passport, the the upstream AS that might interpret the reason header won't even know about that leg of the call. Well, yeah, okay. It, again, if in orchestration you have multiple layers of ASs and like one prior removes it and then you leave the reason header in, that doesn't make sense. But right. like, I assume, yeah, I assume you should remove the entire reason header if you're the AS that's consuming it. Yeah, right? uh, I think, <laughs> I think, right. That's, that's, I think that's complimentary with what Roman said. Um, you can come back on if, if not, but uh, I certainly agree with that point. Any other comments there? Are we okay with where we landed? Okay, um, last one. Uh, should we be more specific to only allow stir specific cause codes and not other SIP? Um, and the parenthetical is my statement, I think yes. Um, what about future proofing for new stir cause codes? Is 603 a stir specific cause code? <laughs> well, I mean, maybe it is now, but it's certainly in RC3061, right? Um, and so 607 what, and 608, I think we agree, or we what, formally think of. What are the cause codes? I, uh, well, 603 is what came to mind, right? <laughs> And now sucks up plus. Well, yeah. Well, but well, like, but, but you're, I think you're asked, uh, this is Rich Shockey. Yeah. You're asking about extensibility here, uh, in terms of cost codes, and sure, I mean that's what we always do. And you know, six oh eight and that abomination six oh seven. I'll go. We don't need to go there, but uh, yeah, sure. I mean, but how extensive and how extensive do you want extensibility? Yeah. Well, I think for 603 plus, it's defined as either SIP or Q850. So I think that doesn't isn't applicable here as long as that's, you know, it doesn't change. So I think for STIR going forward, um, you know, any future STIR, we, we want it to continue to uh, support those new stir cause codes if they get created, right? 
And hopefully they'll have this yeah. as a reference to make sure that there's no issues. I guess I would enumerate the cause codes we mean. So I, I assume what you mean by STIRF specific cause codes are the ones identified in H24 plus ones that are identified in subsequent specifications that are aligned with STIR. Yeah, I believe plus I... 603, maybe plus 403? Uh -huh. mm, I think what I have in there, and I, I would need to verify that, but I believe I do reference 8224 as the, and I think I do say in future STIR related. Um, hopefully I'm saying that correctly. But I think for SIP, that should just follow SIP and Q850 rules of the specification. So I think that that's a different context. I mean, I know it's related to things in the I mean, world Does that of mean stir? that if a new response code is defined, that it thinks it should be STIR related, it should say, hey, I'm STIR related, so I apply here? That's a, in that future specification? Well, I don't know. Maybe this specification is establishing that. I mean, it establishes STIR as a protocol. Yeah. I, mean, I just mean that if a future response code wants to be in this category, it can specify when it's defined as, yes, I'm also in this category. So exactly. do the same thing as all yeah. the other ones. Yeah. That's what I'm implying. Yep. Does that make sense for everyone? Yeah, that would be good. Um, while John's reading that, so I think what the action item is, um, yeah, so on bullet th uh, three, um, being explicit about only allowing a single cause code and for bullet four, uh, no change, I guess, right? We decided to keep reason header removal. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, Ms. John again, the way I read section four, I, I would, I think you, we're gonna need to name at least a couple like other status codes that are in the scope of this, like 603. But we, do we want them to use switch to stir as a protocol? I don't think so. Yeah, I mean, I see, I think I see what the use case is for it. But um, I mean, again, I mean, because the, 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 effectively the use case is, I know that this number is supposed to be signed mm -hmm. and this number is not signed. How do I know it? It's a motoscope way, right? Is, is another way to think about it and maybe clarification that um, these are reason headers that are intended for consumption by the authentication service specifically? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think I think that would probably work. Um, okay. Again, with that, that are both consumable by and presumably repairable by, or at least the only right. thing that, the only thing that would help is if the authentication service repaired it. Right. Right, that, that's the kind of things we're trying to express. Yes, I can clarify that. Um, I can make some fairly quick changes for those items and maybe we can discuss on the list, I guess just to make sure we get good feedback on those items. I forget what I had on the last slide. I think it was just uh, generic. Yeah, I was figuring, I was figuring we'd need another round, but I, but again, I could, I could do that fairly quickly. you'll at least want another round and then we can give people a chance to see if their right. comments are resolved. Yeah. I think it can be settled on the list, hopefully. I think we had general agreement in the room here at least, so. Thank you. Okay. OCSP.
we are totally going to finish early today, which is awesome. We can go yeah, late. We asked for two hours for like the first time and several meetings and we kept running over and now we're yeah, not yeah. going to quite make it. We, this now is just go entirely bar. laziness <laughs> on my part and Chris's part for not upping other specs that should have been up for this. Um, <laughs> but yeah, let's talk about OCSP. Wow, this is so exciting. And this goes back to the heady days of the development of RFC 8226, the place where you defined how to do certificates for STIR. Oh, slide, please. And like, you know, at the time we had this notion, probably we need some kind of real time freshness check for these certificates. And that the check would be a little different than what you're used to in ordinary like web PKI or something. Why is that? It's because the certificates that we defined in A226 have this new field that's called a TN off list. And the TN off list can be, it can contain a couple different kinds of identifiers. One of the things we call service provider codes, which are basically in North America, these fancy codes that like identify who carriers are. The other thing they could take could contain are telephone numbers or lists of telephone numbers. And these are like baked into the certs themselves. So that when you're signing for a call with the cert, you have some sense of like what the scope of authority is of the signing entity. And so there's an issue with that, though, when you start doing telephone numbers and baking them into certs. The problem is people's ownership of telephone numbers, it's kind of dynamic. There's all these factors like local number portability, or, you know, we, we can make up like a million other reasons why um, the, a list that at one point in time was accurate is like a little different at a later point in time. And so, of course, you could just issue new certs like all the time. Um, you know, we like the cacheability properties of certificates at verification services in STIR, so we don't exactly want to put that burden entirely on relying parties. And so instead, we thought, wouldn't it be great if there was some way we could build something into these certs where you could kind of ask, hey, is this particular telephone number? Because if you're a verification service, you just got a call, right? Call comes from some particular calling party number. And the only thing you really want to know at that moment is, should the entity that signed for this call uh, be able to vouch for this number. And so I asked Russ and Sean Turner, uh, who I don't believe could join us today, what's the right way to do that? And we talked about a whole bunch of ways to do that. Uh, today, we're going to talk a little bit about one of them, which is OCSP. Um, we added this OCSP extension to the original uh, draft version of 8226 that basically contained a URL in it that you know you could you or uh, an OCSP extension in it you could use that would then let you be able to inquire with OCSP just pass fail this particular TN is it in scope of the cert or not get back a yes or a no answer. Ultimately, we decided when we were doing RFC 20, 8226, we didn't like have enough uh, incentive, frankly, to include that mechanism initially in the scope of this work. A lot of people were using CRLs because a lot of people were using uh, service provider codes, these SPCs. The great thing about having what's baked into your cert be just like, I'm at and or I'm Orange, or I'm Deutsche Telekom, is that you're not worrying about that like individual level number stuff. And so, you know, basically whether they sign for it or not, is whether you trust at and or Orange or whomever. But now we're actually starting to get into certificate delegation into the idea you might have an entity like an enterprise that owns like a couple thousand blocks or that owns like specific number ranges. They're not a carrier. They don't have these fancy identifiers that carriers have. And you know, as we've looked at the security model of this, both in the IETF and in ADAS and in other adjacent places, uh, we've decided maybe it's time to revisit this OCSP idea. Next slide. So like I had a draft about this that we broke off from 8226 uh, back in the day and that, <coughs> can we next slide it? Sorry. And that draft uh, kind of languished, um, you know, as 8226 went forward, but was originally a working group item because it was a child draft of uh, what became 8226. But it basically showed like a model where, yeah, you're going to have like some ability to do certificate validation that will query back to the logical authority, typically to the CA that issued the cert, to get that real time check on the verification service side for both um, standard o OCN sign calls, like you see on the lower left hand side of the slide, but most interesting in the middle of this like enterprise delegation case. Next slide. 
Now, you know, there is one open issue I want to talk about today, and this is the major thing you will see that is different from the current draft of this from the last one. We've talked about two ways of approaching this, and these ways model how TLS has utilized uh, OCSP in the past. Do either have this query by the relying party on the terminating side, in our case, the verification service, or to staple it? And what does stapling entail? Stapling entails that on the originating side, on the signing side, Somebody would go and get, or maybe have pushed to them uh, beforehand, um, you know, a little piece of cryptography that basically assures you the CA that issued this cert believes, you know, it basically what the OSP response, OCSP response would have been if you went and asked on the terminating side. You just kind of pre-generate that and ship it along with the passport to reach the termination side. And this is really cool, and there are some trade-offs around it that um, are beneficial for privacy and a bunch of other things. But my proposal here today is let's not do that yet. Um, let's just define the way to do the terminating side query, the standard modality of OCSP, and worrying about the stapling later. The main reason being otherwise we can kind of bolt OCSP onto what we're already doing pretty easily. It's like just something on the terminating side that incrementally some people can decide to do or not if they have the capability to go and do this step, get it to the CA, get back their answer. But like actually getting authentication services to acquire these staples, building in the protocol machinery for those staples to be sent across, it seems like a heavy lift out of the gate. And I'd rather kick the tires and whether people are actually going to use this at all, especially in like North American stir shaken before we start looking at optimizations like doing this for, um, for stapling. And like, I'd also add, we're separately exploring using short-lived certs for this purpose that will build on like Acme and stuff like that. And the, the properties of stapling and short-lived certs start to look real, real similar, right? And it may be, you know, we'll say that if you wanna push this to the originating side, it might be better to do that with short-lived certs than to do it with stapling. So I want to talk about that though. So anybody have any feelings about this? If we punted on doing stapling for now, would anybody here or on the virtual world barf over that? Any thoughts? Yeah. What's the point of this without stapling? As in, you you said that the like kind of one of the benefits of like at the moment is that they're very cacheable. Um, which speeds up verification. But if you have to do an OS, o, OCSP dig every time, then that kind of negates the point of that. And you might as well just download a certificate. Yeah, I, I, well, I mean, so there is a difference between OCSP and downloading a cert, especially if what's in the cert is really complicated. I mean, as, as you probably are aware, Jack, a lot of this discussion on the ADA side is about people who don't want to do TN by reference, right? where the AIA field contains the URL to a potentially massive list of numbers that are supported in the cert. And this is being offered up as a sacrificial lamb to prevent that from happening, right? Where instead of having like a massive list that's in the cert of the TNs that are associated with some enterprise that owns half a million numbers or something, um, both for the sake of not revealing those numbers, like the whole set of them to relying parties, and for the sake of just making the actual cost of doing this RTT lower, why not just use SCSP, do the single query saying like, is this number in scope and get back a pass fill? So it's, so it's really about, is this more optimal than the other paths that we're considering for this? Because like I was happy to do TN by ref, right? I mean, that's all in 8226 already. And if your telephone number list is very simple and you aren't concerned about, you know, a relying party learning what the total set of numbers are that the certificate has uh, a scope of authority for, like, you know, TN by rep just works. Then largely people in Addis pushing back on that and saying like, no, that's completely unacceptable. <laughs> that is like led us to want to do this with OCSP. That, that discussion actually ended up in an interesting place. Well, the last time, I was involved was actually ended up with everyone going by ref probably isn't what we want. We probably want something that looks more like OCSP or short lived certs. And the discussion actually went towards like OCSP is basically identical to short lived certs and we already know how to do short lived certs. So we should probably go think about that. 
not that any thinking then happened as far as I'm aware. Yeah, I mean, on the bottom of the slide, you'll see me saying we're to continue to explore the short-lived path separately. And again, I, I think, as I said, the, the properties of stapling and doing short-lived certs look real, real similar. I mean, I think the issue is doing short-lived certs, the best way we, need to, we know to do that is ACME. And like, that's an even heavier lift than any other development thing that we're entertaining for this. Yeah, um, I, I guess um, the main thing I was going to say was that I would be surprised if anyone used this without stapling because it doesn't give any obvious benefits. When you have stapling, it suddenly gives you an obvious benefit, but without stapling, I would be surprised if anyone used it. Okay. This is Chris. So can I ask, Jack, is your point about round trips? I assume about cashability, you said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Round trips, <laughs> cashability, that stuff. Yeah. Okay. I mean, you can still cash the cert, right? You know, it isn't a cert caching problem. There's just you eating the RTT of OCSP on on everything. But again, like getting a short, you know, stapling requires the same thing on the authentication service side, right? It's just a matter of like which, which side pays the cost. Well, and, and my comment was going to be, um, you brought up TN by ref. Um, is your point that um, inserting and removing TNs from a TN by ref is like uh, revoking the ability for that TN to be covered by that cert? Mm -hmm. you're, that's the equivalence that you're making, yeah. Yeah. Because yes. I was going to say that there were for two different use cases, but I, but I think maybe that's what you're implying that we could use those properties to cover those things. Yeah. I mean, um, I, th I think that the short, the short answer to me, there's no such thing as a free lunch, right? Like there, there's, and there's really so many moving pieces between these alternatives, between doing TN by ref, doing OCSB and doing short lived certs. Mm -hmm. And like OCSB has the further issue of, you know, do you do it stapled or not? And like, my point is just, we kind of know how to do this. I think, I think we have a better idea of how to do this without stapling than with it in the sense of what does it look like with stapling? So this is every authentication service has a connection to a CA. It's going to issue them these staples, right? Is it push or pull? I assume that it's pull, right? In the sense of ASs are going to dip the CA, get the staple, and then send it to the VS. Unless they can anticipate what those staples are going to need are in advance, this is exactly the same hit to call processing as it is to do it on the verification service side. It's just a question of like, you know, who does it? And so, I mean, I, 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 correct me if I'm wrong, Jack, I mean, is there some like benefit to doing it on the AS side versus the VS side that I'm missing or? Uh, like the staples need to come from the same place, right? And, and as, just, the, as the VS responses to OCSP do. Uh, and I just want to clarify on the short term, sir, you're looking at that as mutually exclusive. In other words, um, with OCSP, you have a long term cert and you're using OCSP as the mechanism to, to do re revoke it in yeah. freshness. Yeah. Okay. And I'm not saying let's not do short of certs. I'm just saying, as far as I know, that means doing ACME and like that. You know, or at least that—that that is the best way we know to do that. And we've tried to get Acme down people's throats in this forever, and it's been like a real, a real problem. I mean, Russ, can you? Is there anything you can fill in for me? Am I am I adequately describing the trade-off for OCSP versus stapled and not in terms of how the RTT costs are paid? It, except for one thing, um, and that is, OCSP includes a next update field. And so you can cache between uses of if you're validating the same cert. On the verification side. Correct. Yeah, on the inquiry side, yeah. I guess that's true too. So you can think about like staples have an expiry and so they can be at least briefly cached, Correct. yes. But I mean, the fundamental point I'm making is the RTT cost is paid on one side or the other. Mm -hmm. And unless you can anticipate on the AS side the numbers you're gonna need to get staples for, there, there is no RTT gain from stapling versus not. It, it, it will have exactly the same like call processing impact. So um, I think it's you mentioned about that short lived start can be achieved uh, ACME drops, right? Which is TN authority token. 
right? Am I correct? So the short-lived cert is achieved by manufacturing the certs on the AS side. This is not done in real time call processing, right? This is something you do offline, like once a day or once an hour, or once a minute, once a call, I guess if you wanted, but let's pretend you're gonna do it once a day, right? And so you only pay that cost for generating the short-lived cert once a day. And so it does not impact call processing. Where you do pay the cost for that is in cacheability of the cert on the verification service side. Because the more frequently you update it, the more frequently the VS is gonna have to execute, you know, dereference the X5 view and actually get a new cert to validate passports. And so the overall costs of that are less, like, and they're certainly less for call processing, but like the, what, you know, the cost you're paying there is doing Acme star or like whatever it is you're gonna do that's actually gonna get you those short-lived certs. Okay, so one other point I was thinking that how often these numbers are actually um, revoked or not valid for an enterprise, right? So that is also, and maybe an important factor, right, to consider. But there's a ton of entropy. I mean, again, it's, it's, it's any given number could be revoked at any given time or leave the scope of certificate of something at any given time. I mean, my company, New Stars, had a bunch of telephone numbers in uh, the plus one, five, seven, one, four, three, four, like 20 years, right? No, yeah. Nothing ever goes in or out of that. They're just our numbers. Right. So sometimes these things are super static, but then there are some enterprises for which it's actually quite dynamic, especially when you look at things like um, non-carrier entities that are CPAS providers, or, you know, people that have very complex number allocations that involve lots of porting in and out and things like that, but they aren't quite carriers. Mm -hmm. Like that stuff is just brutal. And it's really those kinds of use cases that motivate us for this. Okay. And the last one is that, say, for example, if this is in place, right, then do we still need that, uh, the short lives mechanisms which ACME can provide? Or we can solve this with this one? So I, I, at this point, I'm not counseling that we abandon that okay. path. Okay. I say, let's keep looking at it. Let's look at this. I think this is kind of easier to do which is why I'm presenting this today and not short-lived. There is a short-lived draft. It you know, at least lays out what the major parts of this are. This, the fruit of this looks more low-hanging to me than any others. And we need something, I think, to cover the delegation cases that are now more and more in the wild uh, for sure shaken. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jonathan Lennox, I mean, I just, I'd, I'll say first a reply, one comment on that and then I think I actually came up to say that. I think the question, important question is not how often does it change, but how quickly does it change? How soon do you know, how soon do you need to say, yes, this is dead after you know it's done, you know, which is basically what you're, it's the, you know, DNS or, uh, DTL problem. Um, but what I was gonna say is if you're not doing, if you're doing the terminating side, doesn't this, and you're putting the TNs in the OSCP queries, doesn't that mean the CA or the OSCP verifier gets to know every number that's the telephone number that's calling that uh, VS, that seems privacy problematic. Yeah, so I, I, uh, I don't know if I have this on this slide in particular, but yes, it, I, I'm not sure it's a privacy issue, but it's definitely a, it is leaking information about the scope of certificates between corporations. What is the scope of the active numbers being used? So stapling does uh, largely mitigate that in the sense of because it's the authentication side that's actually one interacting with the CA for this, you're no longer going to get the IP address of the verification service that is sending you the OCSP query. That's definitely a part of this. Uh, nonetheless, I think it's it's an easier path and it's something that can like be bolted onto this. Again, because when you look at it like changing the AS side, you know, for this, then what happens if some ASs implement stapling and some don't? versus what happens in the VS side of this if some VSs implement this and some don't, right? It's really a question of, you know, is the relying party in the driver's seat of this or is the AS in the driver's seat of this? I, I you know, my analysis of this, and this is an incredibly complicated thing across the three options with all their sub options, right, like, and all be done, is that this, this is the easiest thing for us to bolt on, is OSCSP on the verification server side. I don't know, is this, is this like where you need a hum or something? Are people okay with punting stapling is what I'm interested in hearing from the room, group, et cetera. 
Shall we do a raise of hands in Medico? And I guess the question would be, is it worth doing OCSP without stapling? Raise your hand if you think it is okay. It's no. okay for us to initially specify OCSP without stapling. John, John raises his hand. So all you people think it's not okay. Well, wait a minute, he's still typing. <laughs> Okay, so you either raise hand or don't, or click the raise, or click the um, don't raise, or do neither, in which case you're abstaining. So far, only six people care. Okay, <laughs> so. And you know, yeah, remember, I'm, I'm saying initially. I'm not saying we're not going to specify the stapling. I'm just saying that is a lift and is going to take work. We need the game show music. Do, do, do. <laughs> like that. All right, we're going to wrap this up in 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, dismiss. Okay. So, eight people think that it's fine to do that and two think it's not anyone want to anyone want to speak for the those two that haven't already yeah who who still thinks we should not do this unless we do stapling please speak okay that seems pretty lopsided uh So, right. next slide. And I promise, I promise we will get to the stapling part of it. Again, I just think it's, it's a lift. Um, but I will say that if we're agreed about that, I think this is probably pretty close, actually. Like I, I, I asked uh, Sean Turner to take a look. He sent me a mail earlier saying he'd taken a look at it. He thought, because we did this like five years ago or something <laughs> is when we, we spec this out. You still thought it was cool. Really, Russ, I would love you to take a look at it as well and make sure you we'll still do. think it's cool. I think you did the module or something at the end of it. I did. Um, you know, but we could use some more eyeballs. You know, make sure that this uh, doesn't, nothing has changed in the last like five years that we should have been thinking about. Um, but if not, this, this could be close to shipping, actually. It's my, my general impression. So I, I would ask the chairs to identify some reviewers who can take a look at this and explain to me why my previous statement about that was incorrect. And, All right, so uh, we'll, we'll give this uh, a little time to, for people to look at, post comments, and then uh, if we're not hearing anything, we'll do a, a working group last call. Okay. All right, thank you. That's all I got. This is all we got for today. That's all we got. That is all we have on the agenda except AOB. Is there any other business people would like to discuss today? Uh, hi, Jack. I just want to sneak in a question that I asked on the list and didn't get any response to, which might be because no one knows the answer. Um, in the certificates RFC, the TN auth list is uh, only non-critical, which seems like a massive problem because anyone ignoring the TN auth list um, does not correctly understand um, the scope of that certificate and they will almost certainly be wrong. Russ, I'm looking at you, man. Uh, no, which extension? TN auth list. Oh, yeah. it's. That's interesting. So none of them is critical, right? None of them is critical. No stir specific extensions are critical because we felt at the time anybody who got one of these would totally be part of the system and understand the ones in the base RFC. We didn't think. But if that's true, you might as well mark them as critical, right? I don't think it really matters for exactly that point, but it just seemed very odd exactly. to me. Yeah, I mean, well, that was the thinking. <laughs> yeah, that, thus far, we've imagined that these are very specialized 
you know, CAs, right, that are responsible for this, and that anybody is getting anything issued from them, or indeed anybody who is seeing anything signed by them, like, you know, has to be part of some closed or at least curated ecosystem. That's not like a good system. You don't have to have this go away, you're not part of our I mean, are you asking to open the RFC? <laughs> oh, okay. Just to be clear, <laughs> I, I will say that a focused update is an option. But my second question is, who wants it bad enough to write it? Yeah. Because if you want it, you volunteer. Hold your document update. <laughs> if you write it for some other reason. Yeah, that's that's not revised eighty two twenty six. That's what I was just curious. <laughs> what happened to that? Point? This will all go away eventually. <clears throat> yeah, but thank you, Jack. Um, Any other other business? There's like a lot more stuff we need to do. We really need to get some energy behind connected identity. It's something that, um, you know, I, I think you know, Chris actually gave connected identity a read. Uh, this is the RFC 4916 update draft. And I think he came away with a lot of the same kind of dispiriting sentiment, which I have about it, which is that we really need it, but it's really clunky. Like, and you know, this is because original 4916 was clunky um, because it's like hard to solve the problem of how you provide, you know, something cryptographic in SIP responses that like can have any meaningful impact on SIP transaction processing. There are some very technical, like stupid SIP reasons why that's true, but it basically means we're restricted to, you know, putting passports only into SIP requests, not into SIP responses. And like, that means we need PRACs and like all this other stuff. And I just don't know if people are going to do it. And like, I don't, you know, so looking at it, I'm wondering, do we need to figure out something weirder, right? That is weirder than John Elway was thinking when we did 4916, that we think people would actually implement. Yeah, do we want to discuss it? So I, I think part of the reasoning there was also thinking about the whole messaging space as well, which is a different interaction model than, you know, telephone calls. Um, and usually that relationship is established pre so like can we think more about that in terms there is a section in that document that talks about um i think uh non-media invites or something like that where you essentially establish a relationship we need to make sure that you can correlate that from the actual call itself and some other issues like that so i think there's some things to think about but I think that's the perspective I was thinking about, like that we might actually want to use these in different contexts uh, as a maybe separate mechanism. Yeah, because I mean, if you if you know SIP and you look at this RFC 4916 update, I mean, it is full of like medialist dialogues that we're then gonna update and upgrade into like media dialogues. And because this is our best story for like how to actually make identity in the reverse direction work. And, um, I don't know how much appetite is there to go off the SIP reservation on this because this will end up going to SIP core, whatever it is that we do, like because it it's really about you know all the same transaction mapping stuff that we got into post HERFP and like you know all that stuff <laughs> that like led us down this like frack path to get like. Can you do it in a new or um, yeah, well, I mean, effectively you are. The question is just, do you want to do it before call setup? Right? That's the problem. You want to do this in an early media phase because, you know, you, you want this ideally to be pre-alerted. And that's how you end up with medialist dialogues and you have to make assumptions about UA suppressing things and like, it's really, really clunky. I blame John Elway, who is not here. And for that reason, I'm going to blame him. Entirely. Well, I mean, it's not like we actually have to solve for to solve this. It's just like, you know, it, it's really just the, the simple fact. The problem is if you get back 
you get back a SIP response that tells you like, this is the identity dealer side and the response is broken in some way, there's no way to reject a response, right? That's the fundamental problem. Like if you get back 200 okay or 183 with, with early media okay, you know, uh, the, and like what, what is actually in it is a passport and that passport does not support, you don't support a trust anchor or there's something like wrong with the number that's being asserted and like the, then, and of course you need the connect identity trick of getting the from header field to correspond to who you actually reached instead of the original <laughs> transaction mapping identifiers. And that's how you end up with like prac and it sucks. I mean, this is like, this is like such a horrible, awkward way to do this. And like, we'd need to go back to like a SIP level drawing board to fix it. But I don't know how to fix it. So I think we're effectively into what would normally count as offline discussion. It's true. So we can we probably just uh, let people Let's just turn go. this into offline discussion. Thank you so much for coming. And anytime you mention herf P, then beer is required. Yes. Okay, then thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the idea. Do you want to go pay for this in a reverse test? Yes. 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 Committed the wrong email to this. So, and that's Murray. That's Murray. Like, I never can tell if it's that house. So, is she the secretary? Yeah. Oh. Uh, Yeah, but it's actually a very big issue.